welcome you all to the 40th anniversary brunch for the Roe v. Wade decision, 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. There's an interesting article in January 14th Time magazine, and I made a few copies over there, and, and you can, don't take my copy of the magazine, please. And there's a lot of stuff in there. You've seen the map, so there are lots of states with one provider. Um, he or she flies in. They don't have hospital privileges. The state's trying to shut down Planned Parenthood. So they have all these ways of just reducing the clinic's ability to function, making them have five foot wide doorways like they're a hospital facility. So in the, um, the Time article, it says that there were 600 and some bills. I think our speaker, Philida Burlingame, told us this uh, from the ACLU. 600, over 600 bills introduced across the United States to try and shut down and limit women's access. And 92 of them passed in the states last, last year. So that's just more ratcheting down of access for women. There were, in 1982, 2,908 providers of abortion physicians. There are, in 2008, there were 1,793. But one of our speakers later is um, teach, training doctors over uh, in San Jose to be providers. So. And the other just little tidbit, you all remember during the election that uh, Todd Aiken from Missouri made the unfortunate mistake in, from his standpoint of saying that, you know, legitimate rape, the body could shut this down and, you know. So he was defeated by a Democrat. But that Democrat is a pro-life Democrat who does, thinks abortion should only be legal in case of rape, incest, or the life of the mother. So it's not over till it's over. So we're going to, um, the next thing we're going to do now is, his Congressman Farr couldn't be here, but he has an aide, Kristen Peterson, from his office, who has um, or something that Sam read into the con congressional record yesterday. So come on up, Kristen. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here today on behalf of Congressman Sam Farr, who feels strongly about a woman's right to choose. He regrets that he cannot attend today as he is in Washington. However, on Friday the 18th, the Congressman presented a congressional record on the floor of the House of Representatives, and it reads in part, those of us who believe that a woman can make their own choices about their bodies Take heart in knowing that Roe v. Wade is still the law of the land 40 years after the Supreme Court's historical decision. On, beha on behalf of Congressman Sam Farr and the United States Congress, we thank all of you for all of the work that you do in continuing to ensure a woman's right to choose. Sam has been a really good friend to women and reproductive choice. Um, I'm going to turn the program over to Cynthia Matthews, Council Member Cynthia Matthews, former Public Affairs Director and founder, founding member, one of the original founders of Planned Parenthood here in Santa Cruz, where she was only in her 20s. So those of you who are younger, get moving. <laughs> And I want to say to all the people standing across back, I am looking at eight visible seats right up here. So I'm not going to have any sympathy that there aren't any chairs back there for you. So have, come and have a seat up front. Well, this is, um, I think, with the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, it's one of those you know, even zero digit anniversaries that really makes you stand back and say, let's, let's take stock of what's happened. So there's certainly that. And at a time like this, we can see what that landmark decision meant in, in terms of really um, establishing a core principle, but we also, as we reflect back, can see how much remains for that to be achieved. And also just coming out of the recent election, so much was at stake. Carol mentioned one candidate's unfortunate remarks. But there was a clear 
clear division. And now that, that the election is over, we know the Affordable Care Act um, is moving forward. We know that a clearly pro-choice president will be in charge of judicial appointments and executive orders and setting direction for, for so much at the federal level. Um, it gives us a lot of promise. We can see the opportunities that are ahead. So we thought this program, what we do, is kind of go from macro to micro. So our first speaker is going to talk at the federal um, level and state level uh, about taking stock and, and what we're looking at. Then we're going to hear from someone at the county level about what we're doing to expand access to care and how Santa Cruz County has a unique record. And then we'll hear from a couple of our individual local safety net providers. So that's kind of the framework for um, this morning's. It's a little bit different than some of our past programs. So our first sp speaker is Lupe Rodriguez. Uh, Lupe's the Director of Public Affairs at Planned Parenthood Marmonte. And she has an amazing record. I'm just going to take a minute to, to um, give you an idea of her career and uh, her um, commitment to this issue. Prior to coming to Planned Parenthood, she was Program and Policy Director at Access Women's Health Justice. And in this role, she served as the Northern California Coordinator for a national organization, Raising Women's Voices, which is a collaborative for health care reform. She's an alumnus of the um, Women's Policy Institute, an advocacy training program sponsored by the Women's Foundation of California. She's also a member of the National Women's Health Leadership Network, a reproductive ju uh, justice advisory group. Um, she recently served on the board of directors of the California Family Health Council. This is a busy gal. <laughs> um, she's a member of the Human Rights Commission in the city of San Jose and the Santa Clara County Commission on the Status of Women. She currently sits on the boards of California Latinas for Reproductive Justice and Access Women's Health Justice. In 2010, she was honored with the Generation Award for an Emerging Leader. Uh, from the California Coalition, uh, Coalition for Reproductive Freedom. And I think you can see um, by this resume, and I'm sure there's a lot more, um, both her um, achievement in this field, her dedication, and also um, the trend of looking at reproductive uh, choice at reproductive justice in a bigger frame. We're focused on this day and this anniversary because of abortion rights, but but we see it in a much bigger frame um, these days. So, Loopy, where are you? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> You can everybody hear? Okay, I can hear myself echo. So <laughs> thank you so much and good afternoon or good morning still. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Lupe Rodriguez and I am the Director of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood Marmonte. Um, and in my role, I work in several areas. Um, I I'm the representative from public affairs for our coast region, so here in Santa Cruz, um, all the way down to Monterey County. But I also work um, in San Jose, in um, San Mateo County, and Alameda County. So I have a kind of wide perspective of, of the work that we do. Um, so I'll start today, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm talk here to talk about sort of the, the larger picture, the national picture, and, um, and I'll also actually talk a little bit about the state, uh, our state, and, and where we have challenges in this state as well in, in terms of access to reproductive health services. Um, but I'll start off first by just talking a little bit about the organization that I work for, or, or I should say the organizations that I work for. Um, so as many of you know, Planned Parenthood Marmonte is our service organization. Um, it's the largest Planned Parenthood affiliate in the country. Uh, we have like 35 health centers throughout the state of California and northern Nevada. And we, um, we serve over 250,000 patients a year. So we're a really large operation. Um, and and you know, not only do we have services, but we also provide um, uh, education work. So we, we have a very robust education system or program that provides services for pregnant and parenting teens. We have a really successful program called the Teen Success Program, um, which helps young women who are pregnant or parenting, you know, get through high school, maintain their family size, and, and basically, you know, succeed in the future. Um, and then we also have an advocacy program, which I work on. 
And through our advocacy program, we have a sister organization called Planned Parenthood Advocates Marmonte. And that organization helps with, or through that organization, we're able to do political work. We're able to do um, candidate endorsements and um, independent expenditures for candidates. And we're able to do you know, a lot more of the, um, you know, the, the sort of vision of promoting uh, elected officials and helping elected officials who support our work, and not only that, support reproductive justice generally, who support progressive issues and, um, and, and progressive movements for our communities. So, so that's a little bit of what I do, and, and that's from where I'll bring a, a lot of this information for, from the national perspective. Um, I'll, I'll just, just for legal purposes, I'll be talking with my Planned Parenthood advocates Marmonte hat on, because I might be talking about specific candidates. So, um, so, so again, you know, I, I want to start off with with just giving an overview of um, abortion today. Um, as we know, you know, with the Roe versus Wade decision in, in uh, 40 years ago, um, you know, the country changed a lot, and it had a dramatic impact on the health and well-being of American women. Um, and it, you know, certainly, abortion is now safer. We have. Um, access to health centers that are able to provide the care in the most, well, in, in many cases, in, in the best conditions in they're able to provide care um, that's, you know, frontline medical care. Um, and so, so the decision had a really great impact in, in, in making uh, this important medical uh, care uh, accessible for women. However, as was mentioned, in today, in 2013, we have some of the worst access to care since that decision. We have some of the um, most, we have the most barriers to care for women throughout the country than we've ever had before. And this in part um, is because of a number of state level abortion restrictions that have been enacted in the past couple of years. It's actually been, in these past couple of years, as was mentioned, in 2011, there were over 900 provisions um, against reproductive health care that were, that were put forth in various states throughout the country, and 92 of which, uh, uh, which were abortion restric or restrictions on abortion access specifically, which took, it, took effect. And uh, in 2012, it was the second highest number of restrictions ever introduced with 43 restrictions that went into effect and have now and are now the law of the land in a, in a lot of states across the country. Um, and one other, you know, stark, stark note that, that we've seen is that um, more, than ha more than half of all U.S. women of reproductive age now live in a state that is hostile to abortion care, that is hostile to access to abortion. Um, and, and, and whereas fewer than one third of those, you know, a decade ago, uh, less than a third of women lived in a state like that. So now more than half live in a state that's hostile to abortion care. I mean, that's just shows that we've come a long way, but not, I mean, we've come a long way in a lot of different ways, but, but certainly not, not in access to abortion care and, and reproductive health care generally. Um, but, you know, again, just to paint a picture of what's going on, and I think this is a statistic that's been heard a lot, um, that about, you know, by age 45, about half of American women will have an unintended pregnancy. So that's, you know, something that's been known for a while, and it, it maintains at that level. So about half of women will have an unintended pregnancy. And nearly one in three of those who have an unintended pregnancy will have an abortion. So it's still, you know, a high percentage of, of folks who have an unintended pregnancy. Um, and, and what we know about women who have abortions is, is you know, the, the sort of general stereotype that's presented is, is not true. Um, one in six in 10 of these women who have abortions already have children. They have families, they, um, you know, they already have children. They're not the young women that, we, that, we, that, that are presented to us in the, in the media. Um, and 88% of them have their abortion in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. So I think in terms of some of the things that, that have sort of helped with, uh, with access, it, it is important to note that women are having abortions earlier in their pregnancy when, when it's you know, generally safer and when um, there's more access to it. So that's good to know, but, but still, you know, we face these barriers. Um, I think something else that's important to note about, about the sort of trends in abortion uh, now are that abortion in the U.S. has really become concentrated among w lower income women. Um, for example, 42% of women having abortions are underneath the federal poverty line right now. So those are women who live, you know, on like $20,000 a year for a family of four. 
Um, and, and, and and then, I mean, it's further show the reasons why some of this is happening is because unintended pregnancy rates amongst poor women have increased since the 1970s. And um, whereas the rates for, for higher income women um, have decreased since the 1970s. And um, compared to higher income women, lower income women have unintended pregnancies and abortions, but five times more. So they're five times more likely to have an unintended pregnancy. And this is because um, there are huge inequities and disparities in our healthcare system that keep uh, lower income women from having access to general health healthcare. You know, lower income women are less likely to have health coverage, first of all, and then secondly, less likely to have somewhere to go. So even women who have coverage through some of the programs that we have, as was mentioned by Carol, um, you know, in California, we have some great uh, programs, some, some great public programs that help people um, get health care. But um, that doesn't mean that they can find a provider that will you know, give them the care that they need. Um, it's just, it's really hard, speaking from, you know, that perspective of a provider, it's really hard to provide services for lower income people when um, you don't get adequate reimbursement for services. <laughs> and I'll talk a little bit more about how that's creating barriers in our own state, in the state that, you know, as we mentioned, has really great laws, really progressive laws on these issues, but um, we still see a lot of problems in this state. Um, and then, and then, well, and, and, and feeding into that, you know, one of the one of the things that's been shown about about um, lack of access is that, and one of the ways that a lot of the anti-choice movement has has made it difficult for women to access care is is in the way that it's paid for. As we know, right after we had the Roe versus Wade decision in in 1973, um, in 1976 there was this amendment to um, the Appropriations Bill that was called the Hyde Amendment that came into effect. And as many of you know, that makes it so that um, the federal government uh, can't spend or can't you know, help pay for abortion um, in this country, and uh, unless you know, in the cases of rape, incest, the health of the mother, and so what that means is that if a state doesn't choose to spend its own money on, on you know, including that in the package of services that a person can receive when they when they have a state health care program, then it's not covered at all, and people have to pay for it out of pocket. And one of the things to know is that the average cost of an abortion in 2008, it was estimated, is $580. I mean, for somebody who's making uh, you know, $20,000 a year with a family of four, $500 is an incredible amount of money. And, and, and so you know, that has been a huge barrier for, for women um, throughout you know, the, the last, what is it, 37 years that we've had uh, the you know, legal right to abortion in this country. So, so that's, that's, I think, one of the important barriers to note. And then, and this is where I'll sort of segue into talking about sort of all of the different restrictions that have come into effect. Um, there are innumerable other barriers to abortion access um, that have come into effect. Things like, you know, biased counseling, which is when, um, you know, many states have these laws where uh, their own doctor has to give women this incredibly, um, faulty advice, or not advice, but, but just information, quote information that's like, uh, you know, that, that abortion causes breast cancer or, or really egregiously, egregious misinformation about the procedure to, to, you know, counsel them out of, you know, the decision that they've made. Um, there's also states that have insurance bans. So, so you know, not only do we keep uh, lower income women from accessing care by not, you know, by sort of pricing them out or not, not covering this care for them, but we all, we're also doing it in a lot of states to people who have private insurance, um, who have insurance through their employers, by allowing employers to say, oh, we're not going to cover that because we don't want to, we don't believe in it. Or I mean, not even just they don't believe in it, but simply that they don't want to. Um, we also have things like waiting periods, where women have to wait 24 to 72 hours to, once they've decided you know, that they want to move forward with having an abortion, they still have to wait 24 to 72 hours before they can get the procedure. And, and for many women who, you know, the other point is that many women have to travel really far to get uh, the care that they need. I mean, for women who have to travel five hours to get to where they need to go to get this procedure, having to wait 72 hours before they're able to do it is incredible. I mean, it's, it just creates so many barriers that, that are sometimes insurmountable for people. 
And, and then there are the uh, unnecessary ultrasounds and intimidation that's making people listen to uh, like a fake heartbeat that's in an ultrasound, making people look at an ultrasound, um, and, and, and then the parental consent requirements. Um, in, in many states, uh, teens, young women, have to either alert their parents that they're having an abortion or, uh, or get their consent. And, and for many young women, many teens for whom, you know, who live in, in situations of violence or of other types of intimidation from their families, I mean, that, that keeps them away from this care. And I can talk, I'll talk a little bit about how in California, um, some of these fights against that kind of uh, pr uh, proposal have, have really, you know, set us back. Um, so, so I'll, as I mentioned, you know, in, um, in 2012, there were 40, so not as many as last year, not, not the 92 provisions that went into effect last year, but this year, uh, or in 2012, there were 43 new provisions um, in 19 states. So, you know, it's still a really high number of, of provisions going into effect to take away our rights. Um, and most of the new restrictions enacted in 2012 um, concerned limits on later abortion, um, coverage and health insurance exchanges. So what I was mentioning about keeping more than just lower income women from getting this care and, um, and, and issues of, uh, like, as was mentioned by Carol, you know, taking away or making it more difficult for providers to be able to provide the care by, by putting these onerous um, requirements on them. So first of all, the, there's a, one provision called the Targeted Regulation of Abortion Providers called TRAP, which um, in 20, yeah, it, exactly what it is. In 2012, um, Arizona, Michigan, and Virginia um, took steps to establish more stringent regulations. So basically making it so that health centers have to have, you know, hallways that are larger so that um, they have to, you know, reconstruct their whole health center clinic to be able to uh, be a surgical center. To, to put a, that kind of thing into effect if they need if they want to provide services, um, to um, requiring that providers have um, like easy hospital admittance to to an emergency center, even if that emergency center is far away, and even if they don't provide uh, the type of a surgical procedure or surgical abortion procedure that would require that. The, um, in these states, they're they're putting that into effect, um, and then and then. Other things about like later abortion, they are in Arizona, Georgia, and Louisiana. They enacted measures to um, basically say that fetal viability starts at 19 weeks, or and that and that pr procedures can only be done until then. I mean, in many of these states, there are only like two providers for the entire state, and and when you reduce the time that those providers are able to provide this service, then obviously people are going to be left out. And one of the questions that, that always comes up about why that's so important, why that, that sort of limitation on the gestational age is so important is because, um, well, one of the things that, that we know from experience here in California is that women don't always know that they're pregnant. I mean, or many do, but, but a lot of the reason why women have late-term abortions is um, because they're young women, we see that a lot, because they, they may not know that they're pregnant or they may not know... They may not have made the decision. And then furthermore, when I was talking about the, the money issue, if you, have to, if you have to pay $500 and you have maybe $10 a week that you can you know, put away for this, you have to save up for weeks, for months even. And that delays you, your ability to get this procedure. That, that makes it so that you have to go into uh, the 20 the week range. Uh, and so, so this, is, this is really important. It, it might seem for, for a lot of people that, you know, well, why are people having abortions at, at that late gestation? But, um, but, but I mean, that, that's part of the issue, the, the money issue. If they don't have, if they have to save up for, for this, um, and or that you know, or they don't know they're pregnant, or they have other conditions that keep them from from being able to make this decision and, and getting the care they need, um, then they're they're left out. And then and then I mean, furthermore, you know, the fact that that because of these new restrictions, there are less and less providers um, is is you know is really really important to note. Um, 
And then something else that, that has come into effect. So, so a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the restrictions, the majority of, of the restrictions that came into effect in 2012 were around abortion care. But there are also these really, really awful restrictions on just funding in general for providers who, who provide abortion care. And, and these are providers like Planned Parenthood that, uh, for the most part, provide you know, preventative primary care, um, you know, family planning services. And, and in fact, the majority of the care that, that we provide is that. Um, and so, so there's these like restrictions on on and and frankly discriminatory policies on who can receive state funding for for um, for the services they provide. So, for example, as many of you know, in Texas this year, and and so far it's looking it's not looking so great because in Texas the state decided that they were not going to fund they were going to exclusively leave out Planned Parenthood from state family planning funding. And uh, because of the connection with with uh, providing abortions, and um, and and you know, uh, Planned Parenthood appealed, won an injunction on on you know not receiving funding because um, they you know they said that that was discriminatory. You can't single out a single provider for for you know the care that they do if they're if you're using that money for family planning. Um, and but then another court they sued again and another court came back and said you know what they can exclude you and that's where it is now that um, Planned Parenthood in Texas is essentially defunded and and you know they're still figuring it out but I think that that's the kind of thing that we're moving towards so this is like not just it's it's from every angle it's it's not just you know straight restrictions on abortion it's things like completely you know defunding all the providers that exist that are able to provide this care and and making it so that um there's nowhere to go there's nowhere to go so and then that goes to what was said earlier about the fact that we have what is it like one third of the providers we had a decade ago in in everywhere in the country. And in fact, 87% um, of, of counties in the, the country don't have an abortion provider. And in California, it's a little bit better, but still, it, in, in California, about 47% of our counties don't have an abortion provider. And people have to travel to get care. Um, so that, that sort of brings me to California. Um, it, you know, we, as, I, as was mentioned, we have really great laws, we really progressive uh, movement for, for people, um, and, and we sort of sometimes feel like we live in a bubble. And in fact, actually, we are moving forward in the state of California this year with a bill that will hopefully increase access to abortion care. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that after I tell you about the problem. <laughs> so the problem right now is that we don't have enough providers. And it's, it's because of a number of factors. I mean, first of all, b even before we had these awful budgets in the past couple of years at the, at the, in the state legislature, um, we were being reimbursed. Or, and by we, I mean providers that provide health care services for, for Medi-Cal beneficiaries, for lower-income people, were being reimbursed at rates from the 1980s. So for, so for an abortion, um, we would get $260 regardless of you know what gestation what sort of uh, what kind of procedure was necessary everybody gets reimbursed two hundred and sixty dollars for a procedure that costs over five hundred thousand whatever so so that's the first problem I mean it's difficult enough to, to be able to provide it but if you're not you know you're not able to keep your doors open that's that's important but then additionally just this December um, a, a court agreed so so in in when the budgets pass in past years there was a provision that was put forth by the governor uh, and was passed by the legislature to cut back reimbursement rates even further so again those rates from the 1980s are being cut 10 percent for most services and and you know several people went to court about it and most recently in December one of the courts upheld the right of the state to do that to to providers so so again you know right now we're in this moment where you know 10 percent less of of for everything not just abortion care but for everything um is is going to be reimbursed 10 percent less and and i think that that's a really i mean that, that'll if people think about you know again we have a great state but if there aren't any providers to provide this care then nobody's going to get it and, and I think that that's really important to think about in California and, and in any kind of advocacy work that you do moving forward that um, this isn't like a really sexy or, or you know, a thing that catches the news, but, but it's really important to know. And, it's re and it could be potentially really devastating to uh, those of us who provide this care. 
And, and then, you know, and so one of the things that we're doing here in California, because we recognize, well, and, and even beyond that, you know, there, there it, as I mentioned, in 47% of the counties in this state, we don't have abortion providers. And what we found is that a lot of women, particularly from areas like the Central Valley, have to travel to the coast to get the care that they need. And at the organization I worked for before, Access Women's Health Justice, we, we, we helped with that. We basically gave people bus tickets and uh, hotel rooms to stay overnight in San Francisco or in San Jose or wherever they had to travel to get the care that they needed. We gave them money for, for childcare. They have to leave their children for two days sometimes to get a procedure. Um, we, you know, we gave them food money. Um, so. So there are organizations like Access doing that work, and it's and it's mind-boggling, you know. Again, that that people need this support to be able to get this this care that they should be able to get in their own communities, and so that's why we're doing this year. Um, we are sponsoring a bill that will increase access to early abortion care by um, expanding the statute uh, and and allowing advanced practice clinicians like nurse practitioners and physicians assistants um, and certified nurse midwives. Uh, to provide uh, abortion care, early aspiration abortion. And um, it's, you know, there's been a, a study by the University of California in San Francisco that just came out. Um, it's a, a six year long, seven year long study that has shown that it is safe to do this. And so, um, so this year we're putting that legislation forward. It still doesn't have a number or name, so I can't tell you any of that, but, um, but we'll be sending out information about that. And I think, you know, we are hopeful that with the few providers that we have <laughs> in these areas, that if we're able to expand the workforce that is able to give this care, then people will be able to get the care in a more timely manner and won't have to go away, go, you know, 100 miles, 500 miles to get what they need. So, so that's what we're doing. And, um, and I guess one other thing I'll say, you know, that's a little bit of a silver lining here in California of, of sort of what we're doing proactively to, to increase this access to care. But I also want to talk a little bit about the fact that even though it seems like the country's going crazy and, you know, rights are eroding everywhere else, um, there's some really interesting research that Planned Parenthood and others have done around, you know, how most people feel about abortion. And I think and one of the most sort of interesting things that was found in, in these, these studies is that, um, I mean, well, first of all, that, that when you first poll people and ask them, like, do you identify as pro-choice or pro-life? Most people actually say they identify as pro-life. And they, these studies found that the reason is that people don't know what that means. <laughs> they don't know what it means to be pro-life. They don't know what it means to be pro-choice. And frankly, they don't identify with any of those labels. And, and that's not a good way to talk about these issues. That's not a good way to, uh, you know, to talk about the fact that, that abortion should be legal and is a, is a you know, medical choice that people should have. So, so, the, so, you know, when we delve further into this, um, we found that, as we thought, that nearly two-thirds of Americans believe that abortion should be legal. They, beyond the labels, like they might call themselves pro-choice, but they still think abortion should be legal. So they don't, again, those labels don't mean anything to people. And, and, and furthermore, and, and about 40% of those people say that it's a personal decision and they don't, they don't want have anything to do with it. They think it should be legal, and people should make their own choices. Um, and, and well, and then the other thing is that about overall, about seventy-six percent of people of color in this country, people who sometimes we, we've we've thought you know are more conservative for religious reasons, and, and I'm talking particularly about Latinos. Seventy-six percent of Latinos believe that abortion should be legal in most or all cases. So that's another thing that, that I think is important to know because it shows that a large part of our population um, believes this, this should happen and is with us on these issues. So that's a little bit of the silver lining of all of this craziness that, that you know, this is actually going against most of what people feel and believe. And that, and that gives us the hope that you know, if we're able to, to move this constituency, then we're, we're gonna be able to change what's going on. Um, and so one of the things about, about us, about, about Planned Parenthood, is that, is that we found that we're able to help people win elections <laughs> with, but, you know, by using some of this messaging, by helping them, you know, oftentimes like, you know, the money that we're able to give them isn't that great, but to candidates that is. Um, but, but just having our support and having our name and having the messaging is helpful. 
And, and we know that because we actually did some really good studies in 2010 uh, in the gubernatorial election and, and the Senate race with Senator Boxer um, and found that more than a third of, of voters in the state of California who heard about the issue of abortion in the 2010 race um, said that they were less likely to vote for Carly Fiorina because they knew that she was anti-choice or that she was against abortion. So, so I think, you know, that kind of thing. And, and similarly with, with, um, with uh, Governor Brown, when people heard that Governor Brown was pro-choice against Meg Whitman, who's, who wasn't, you know, pro-choice, um, they were more likely to, to vote for, for, to say that they were not gonna vote for, um, for Meg Whitman. So, so the messaging works, again, people are pro-choice, or let's not use that word anymore, people uh, believe that abortion should be legal and believe that people should have the right to make these choices for themselves. And, and so I think this is what we're, we're taking and moving forward, that um, we are, you know, we have everybody behind us and, and in these beliefs, and, and so um, I think we'll be able to do great things moving forward. Thanks so much. Thank you. Whoop. Thank you, Lupe. And doesn't that give you confidence about our future? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Mike is not on. Speak louder. Lean forward. <laughs> I'm a little taller. <laughs> um, uh, our next, now we're going to bring our, our focus on reproductive choice and access to services down a little bit closer to the local level. Louder still? Yeah. That better? Okay. Um, I can, I can, no, it's, ta it's taped on. I can't do that. <laughs> they won't let me. <laughs> um, I'm going to make a couple of comments before I introduce our next speaker. First of all, um, I can't say enough about the value of Planned Parenthood's involvement electorally through its advocates. And I will tell you as a candidate um, that Planned Parenthood is a five-star golden name to have as an endorsement. It's a very trusted name. And when you know all the women, uh, and by extension their partners and their families who have turned to Planned Parenthood and received quality care, sensitive care, it's a very trusted name, and that's the importance of when, when they weigh in on a, on a political issue, it, it really counts for a lot. And so I urge you in the next election cycle to support the advocates. There you go, a plug. <laughs> um, bringing it back down locally, Lupe mentioned a little bit about uh, some of the um, um, better range of policies that we have at the state level, and what we're gonna look at now is how Santa Cruz has taken those policies and really run with them to make to offer the best possible care. Um, and I will mention just a couple that aren't related to abortion services, um, but in the area of emergency contraception and sexually accurate um, or medically accurate sex education, those are two areas where um, in, in past years the state of California has really been in the forefront of ensuring um, good progressive policies those policies have come come at the local level. Santa Cruz has been often the county that did the pilot study that led to those laws being adopted um, and that proved that those were sound public policy. So that's what we're going to do now is move to the um, county level. Our next speaker is Ellie Littman. Ellie is the director of the Health Improvement Partnership, which is uh, an amazing, unique collaborative. You may not have heard of it, but it's done terrific things here in Santa Cruz County, and she'll explain it more. Um, she's had a lifetime in progressive public um, uh, policy and uh, work. She mentioned to me that she was named after Eleanor Roosevelt, so that shows you the, <laughs> the family values transmitting here. She served in the Peace Corps. Her first um, uh, professional degree was in planning. She worked in the Seattle area. She got then very interested in some of what was being done in Santa Cruz in the area of childbirth, moved to Santa Cruz, did a career switch, went to Cabrillo and got her nursing degree, um, has worked in the uh, fields of uh, uh, childbirth and hospice both, um, 
And uh, more recently, uh, now with her work at the Health Improvement Partnership, she said she wanted to bring a clinical voice to health policy. So um, that's what she's doing now brilliantly, uh, helping pull together providers so that we can offer the best possible care here in Santa Cruz County with the tools at our disposal and invent some new ones. So Ellie, it's yours. <laughs> Well, I'm so local, I have the community cold, so I'm at the end of it, but, hope, but let me know if my voice trails off and you, uh, you can't hear, and I have my stuff here, uh, just in case. So I, I really want to thank uh, both uh, Carol and uh, Cynthia for this invitation uh, to join you today and to really follow uh, what Lupe uh, so well laid out for us in terms of the national and, and the state landscape and challenges. Of course, my first reaction is, thank goodness I work at the local level and not, with those th uh, not at the state or, or national level. Um, and obviously, our work at the local level has to always be within the context of what's happening uh, at the state level and the national level. So, uh, really applaud them and, and um, you know, important to know about and also important to know about kind of how do we um, take the opportunities here in Santa Cruz County and maximize the opportunity particularly of uh, the Affordable Care Act to really uh, increase access uh, to health care in our community and to move forward, uh, particularly in the area of reproductive services. I thought that comment about um, that low-income women are as five times as likely to have un untended pregnancies as well, and therefore as abortions, is really important to remember at the local level because that's where we can do something in terms of making sure that there's access to uh, reproductive services and uh, as well as access to abortion. Uh, so the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, it's an eight-year-old coalition of public and private healthcare leaders that includes the hospitals, it includes physician groups, it includes safety net clinics, uh, including uh, the, the the, the groups that are, are on either side of me here, Planned Parenthood, Marmonte, and Santa Cruz Women's Health Center. And um, the, there are brochures on the table under the ACLU um, sign uh, about uh, our organization, our members, and what we do. But there are also um, many hipsters in the audience here today who, of course, are going to be the best way to learn more about the Health Improvement Partnership. So how many hipsters do I Hipsters, raise your hand. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> we define a hipster as anyone who's been to more than two meetings. Anyone who came... <laughs> Anyone who, came, anyone who came the first time and came back is, 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 joins the hipster group. So at the core of what HIP believes is the old adage um, in, that politics as well as healthcare are local. And that really at the local level, we can really do uh, a lot of things if we, we work together uh, to do those. For the last two years, in anticipation of federal uh, health care reform and specifically coverage expansion, uh, we have focused on strategies to maximize the local benefit of federal, uh, federal reform. That is to ensure that coverage expansion, more people, and particularly low-income people, getting health care coverage translates for them into health care and into the kind of health care that we want uh, that we think people have a right to have. Um, HIP's collaborative vision is that all residents of our county will have access to a patient-centered medical home that provides comprehensive primary care services, including reproductive services. So what is a patient-centered medical home? Do we have to, healthcare um, professionals do tend to make up, uh, uh, need a term and a jargon for things. It, it actually is no one thing. It looks really different as different models, different framework, but the essence of, of it and what is the common element and I think really important to the discussion today is that a patient-centered medical home is a primary care uh, medical setting that supports developing a relationship between the patient and their healthcare providers. And, 
that's the that's what ma that's the common thread, um, and that's kind of the overall purpose of of all the various things uh, that go into having a patient-centered medical home. Ideally, a uh, medical home includes non-medical services, uh, such as behavioral health, and I think you'll hear a, a little bit from um, Jen Hastings about that uh, this morning. And particularly for safety net clinics serving uh, primarily a low-income population, healthcare centers are also uh, Healthcare centers to be medical homes also need to be engaged with other community organization uh, to to really work collaboratively with the community on the things that really determine eighty percent of of uh, the community's health status, which are the safe streets and good nutrition, and. And when someone is seriously ill, also helping to build communities of support for that individual. Um, and essentially, we're talking about health homes in health, in neighbor, in health neighborhoods. Um, uh, I know Leslie and Jen will be talking about some of the things they specifically have done over the last three years, both independently and under the umbrella of Health Improvement Partnership to advance uh, patient-centered medical homes uh, in their clinics. But I wanted to tell you about what, we're, what the Health Improvement Partnership is doing with all our um, members uh, in 2013, because I think it's something that will have uh, a uh, really impact um, on the patient experience that we have in this county if we can move in this direction. And of course, we wanna hear whether that's uh, indeed the case. We're really gonna focus this year on uh, t something called team-based care. And we wanna move, uh, we wanna start transforming our primary care system so that it's not so much centered anymore on that PCP, that primary care provider, and is really more centered on a primary care team. This is not new, we've been doing, we, you know, this, this has happened and this exists in a lot of, there are lots of teams out there that have been working in this way, but really to make that part of the standard of practice uh, in Santa Cruz County. Particularly starting in the safety nets, we like to start innovations in the safety nets and move them up uh, or down to uh, uh, the non-safety net providers in our, our community. And um, so specifically what we're doing is we're uh, partnering with UCSF uh, and their Center for Primary Care Excellence and Cabrillo College to develop a local program that uh, a local curriculum and training program for medical assistants to teach them uh, the skills to be health coaches and to really be an important and uh, member of that healthcare team. And we're also going to have community-wide uh, medical education programs that uh, that you know the team needs you know needs not just uh, uh, well trained members but it also needs kind of uh, needs to know how to people need to work know how to work as a team so we're also going to do community wide uh, training for uh, physicians nurse practitioners physicians assistants other members of the team about how to work as a team and and about the concepts of, of uh, sharing care among a team now you know, why did why are we doing this this year well we know that with coverage expansion, we're, the ongoing problem we've had, the chronic problem we've had in terms of shortage of primary care uh, physicians is just gonna get worse. And so team-based care is a way of helping to spread primary care physicians and, and onto a team and, and quite honestly to help, um, help uh, mitigate uh, that shortage. And uh, you know, that's the motivation. That's what primarily brings healthcare providers to the table. That's what brings the foundations uh, to us and the Central California Alliance for Health to us to help support this work. But at the same time, I, um, uh, the proponents of team-based care really believe that it also improves the experience of care for patients. Because one, it gives you more access if you're not just talking about one person you need to get in to see, but you're talking about a team that may be a team of physician, and a nurse practitioner, for example, or a physician's assistant. But the other side of it is that um, particularly around uh, asking questions, sounding board to make decisions, 
to have a team of people at where you get primary care who know who you are um, gives you more choice in terms of, of getting consultation on those on on both the smallest of questions that you may have about a medication or what you should do, as well as those important questions like reproductive services. So um, um, we, you know, I say I'm paid to be optimistic, but that's uh, we really hope that this is not only a thing, not only an intervention that um, will make a difference in terms of cost of care, access to care, but also will we'll also improve my, your experience of care and primary care uh, in this county. And, you know, those are local things we can do. Those are things we can do within the existing structure. And um, so um, that's what uh, we're up to uh, this year. Um, I also wanted to uh, just uh, comment that the, um, uh, on an article you may have seen in the paper about the fact that Medicare came to Santa Cruz County to find out why we are why our health care locally is really different than it is in the uh, in the rest of the state and the rest of the country. Specifically, uh, they came because the data shows that they spend less money in Santa Cruz County on institutional care, less money on hospital care, and a lot less money on long-term care. They spend more money on hospice. And, and overall, they spend less and get more in Santa Cruz County, and the data didn't tell them that, so they had to come to find out what, uh, what it, uh, to hear the stories and begin to understand what it was that made, uh, that makes the data look that way, and, and therefore, you know, and obviously they're trying to figure out how can they, how can they export what we do to other places. One of the things um, that, that came out of a really interesting afternoon of telling stories to them uh, is that there, you know, yes, we are a collaborative community. We have lots of collaboratives. This is one of them, and and those are all really important. But but the thing um, that stood out from the stories and and uh, what people what people uh, remarked on was that we're a community that that an activist community. And, but we also like to work at the, at the seams. We like to not, not over the, you know, we don't go over the limits. We were careful with Medicare in the room not to say that we don't follow their rules. But we like to, we like to work to the limits of their rules to make healthcare work for us as a community and to make healthcare work for us as individuals. So, you know, I think that's really in the spirit of what we're talking about today. It's important to know what's happening, to know what the issues are in California, to support legislation um, such as expanding abortion providers to do that, and then figure out ways to uh, make the reimbursement work and to uh, make our healthcare system work. Because I think that's, there, there's something there, um, we're just starting to think about it, there's something there that's the essence of what makes this community and you know this room full of people is really an example of, uh, of that is uh, we need to know the issues, we need to be involved, and then on the individual level, we need to really make it work for, uh, for patients and figure out how we can do that within our framework. So I thank you, uh, and I thank you for the work that you do and for being here today. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and I hope you've all learned something about the Health Improvement Partnership. It's just a great success story here in Santa Cruz. So again, um, bringing down even closer to a couple of our key uh, health care providers, safety net providers, we're next going to hear from Leslie Connor. Um, Leslie uh, has a, a career in uh, as I know her, <laughs> in safety net services. I first met her when she was the development director for Dante's, the local um, dental clinic locally. She then went to HIP, Health Improvement Partnership, where she was the program and policy director for several years. And for the last 14 months, she's been the executive director of the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center, while at the same time getting a master's in public health at Columbia. A busy girl. <laughs> yeah. But before Leslie comes up, I also want to acknowledge um, in the audience today, C.L. Benedetto. Oh, I saw you a long time, um, <laughs> um, long time early um, and visionary 
and effective uh, executive director of the Women's Health Center. So what we're hearing today is a continuation of a, a great tradition. So Leslie, tell us what's in your future. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad that you um, noted that uh, Ciel is here because I've, I've had some chance, a chance to talk with her and learn more about the history. So for a 40-year-old organization at 14 months, I'm sort of an infant um, in the history of the, the clinic. Um, and I just want to give a shout out too also to the Women's Health Center staff that are here, a fabulous staff. Yeah. Um, so 40 years ago, there was a lot happening, as we know, with Roe v. Wade's anniversary. Last year was the 40th anniversary of Our Women, Our, Our Bodies, Ourselves, which is that revelatory book that so many of us were inspired by and um, motivated by. And in 1974, 40 years ago, next year, the Women's Health Center was born, and it was essentially born by um, a group of women uh, from UCSC, primarily, who um, converge to um, help uh, drive women over to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, for abortions that weren't available locally. And then they evolved and became a reproductive health and education organization designed to empower women to take care of their own bodies and make decisions about their own health. And 40 years later, um, the healthcare system and healthcare needs have grown so dramatically and changed so much that the Women's Health Center has likewise evolved. And so today, um, because of skyrocketing costs, because of a system that uh, creates rationing of care based on your income or your health condition, the epidemic of chronic conditions and diabetes and pediatric obesity, to um, name uh, two that are, that are really um, impacting the health of our community. The Santa Cruz Women's Health Center is now a full service family practice health center that provides prevention, chronic disease management, um, uh, uh, family planning, acute care, mental health services. Um, we serve homeless patients. We serve women who are single moms who are trying to get out of an unsafe relationship. We have every day we, we, we receive thanks from our patients and it's not uncommon for us to say this clinic saved my life. Uh, for us to hear that. So today, we are poised to, to change even more because the Affordable Care Act has granted us with new funds to expand. And so in 2014, when we turned 40, we were also going to be opening up a second clinic in the Live Oak community. And so that's an underserved area, as we all know. There's a pockets of need in our community. Live Oak is one of them. There are no health clinics serving low-income um, patients and in a full-service way. The Rotacare is there, which is a great resource. But we want to open a full-service clinic that serves patients of all genders, that has a wellness and prevention focus, that serves, uh, provides pediatric care, and that really helps to create more access across the community so that when more people are eligible because of the affordable Care Act, there will be an additional um, high quality health care uh, center for them to, to go to. Um, our mission is to provide high quality health care services and advocate the feminist goals of political, social, and economic justice. So, again, the spirit in which we were born lives on today despite all those changes. Um, our downtown cl clinic, when we expand, will remain a wim thriving women's health care center. And, um, uh, we, we will never leave those roots behind as advocates, so whether we're providing health care to women or whether we're registering our patients to vote or whether we're out there in the community screening and, and um, uh, identifying people that need access to care so we bring them back to the clinic to be assigned to a primary care provider, we're going to still hold true to those original values. We believe that health care is a fundamental human, human right, not a privilege that all health care decisions need, need to be driven by the best of what science tells us. Um, in concert with what the, a woman or a patient's values and needs are, delivered by a provider with respect and dignity who understands what her patient needs and works with her to make the decisions that are right for her or him. Um, the last thing I just wanted to note is that, as Ellie sort of referred to, 
We have to remember that true health, lasting health, really is created in the community, not in the exam room. And that it is really up to all of us to ensure that healthy choices in our community are the easy choices, that no one is isolated and left behind, um, or left to fend for themselves in a healthcare crisis or other kind of crisis, that our community is equitable, that our, that our community members are empowered, particularly young women are empowered to take advantage of all the opportunities that we can help make available to them. And um, that's really how we get to a healthy community. So w as the Women's Health Center, we're, we're dedicated to making sure that there's access and respect and choice for all our patients. And we look forward to working with you on the outside of our walls to really help make a healthy community. So it starts here today um, for me going forward. And I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. It does make you proud of our community, doesn't it? It's great. So um, our final speaker is someone known to many of us, um, Dr. Jennifer Hastings from um, the West Side Planned Parenthood Clinic, where she's been for 15 years now. Uh, she's the uh, resident physician there at West Side, uh, but has a reach that far extends that one uh, health center. Um, she currently is uh, teaching abortion to um, residents from UCSF and Natividad um, at, in the San Jose Clinic, Planned Parenthood Clinic. She's been mentoring, um, uh, who mentioned the state legislation uh, for mid-level practitioners to expand the pool of providers? Well, Jen is mentoring uh, some of those advanced mid-level um, um, clinicians, nurse practitioners, um, and physician assistants to become abortion providers in anticipation, this is a pilot project, in anticipation that the research will um, again confirm that this is a, a both cost effective and quality way of providing that service. She also was a leader in um, offering, developing and offering uh, transgender medical care at um, Planned Parenthood Westside, which has now become a national protocol for Planned Parenthood. So Jennifer is not only a uh, a wonderful physician for an individual client with whom she's working, but she's been um, visionary in bringing forth new programs and uh, is a great leader. And she's going to tell us what's in store for Planned Parenthood. So I'm short, so hopefully I can be heard. Sound good? Thank you so much. This is a great honor to speak at this event. Leslie, you gave me goosebumps. I think you really articulated so beautifully what we hope for our community. And I, we love um, that we get to collaborate with other safety net clinics. And the Health Improvement Partnership and the Safety Net Clinic Collaborative have been just a wonderful forum for us to really, truly support each other. And Rama, thank you so much. Rama Khalsa is here, who really started and had the vision for this collaborative. And it's so important. And we truly are a model for the rest of the country. Country. It's and that the, you know, the federal folks from Medicare came to look. I think the Health Improvement Partnership is one reason that we're that we do stand out in afford in providing for our community quality care that is also cost effective. And I think that's um, where there's something called the Triple Aim that is a national uh, effort. And we're at the leading edge. And Ellie, it's a lot thanks to you that that's happening. So. Um, I have just a few minutes, and what I wanted to talk about were two things in particular. There are these very colorful flyers um, at the table, because in fact, what Luby was talking about in terms of access, challenges have come to Santa Cruz, and that is that every Saturday there are protesters at our clinic, and we do want and need escorts to make sure that a woman and her partner or a woman and her family feel emotionally safe coming into the clinic. And so you have an opportunity to support women and support our community and create the vision that um, Leslie was talking about where we all feel safe to, to get the care that we need. And so um, I'm going to have Ali stand up. Uh, she is based in San Jose, but has her uh, email, which either is Santa Cruz vol at PlannedParenthoodMarmonte.org or San Jose. It's the, it goes to the same spot. 
and you can um, email her if you're interested in being coming an escort. There is a training. You need to spend some time to learn how to be an effective and uh, helpful escort, but we'd love to have you join us on Saturday mornings. In addition, in, the, in our clinic, we welcome volunteers as well. We do need at least a six month co uh, commitment, but we'd love to have you join us in various ways. So if that interests you, you can also contact Allie. And we're interested in young, and if you're retired and have some time on your hands, we'd love to have you join us. Then I also want to talk about um, something that I think was on your seat. Join us for an event. And this is um, an event that is highlighting a, a pilot program for Planned Parenthood, which, and it is happening, this concept of integrating behavioral health mental health and primary care is happening around the country and already in the safety net clinics in Santa Cruz um, if, if you're part of the Meta Cruz Advantage program. But essentially, uh, we wrote a grant um, to the Community Foundation and they um, gave us some funds to start a pilot program and we want to tell you about it. Uh, and it, this is in kind of an alignment with the Affordable Care Act, and we have an incredible speaker, February 7th. We'd love for you to join us. Michael Policar, who is, if you've never heard him before, he is stunning. And he's going to talk about the Affordable Care Act and what that might look like for uh, Planned Parenthood and women's health, but then I'll be talking about the uh, behavioral health aspect. Please join us. So in order to find out where it is, you need to go uh, to the link that is on this piece of paper that's on your chair. If you are not uh, comfortable with the, uh, email and webs and all that, John Waller is behind there and would love to talk with you if you'd like more information. His phone number, I'll give it to you if you're not a web user, 460-3110, 460-3110. And we'd love for you to join us February 7th. And thank you so much for coming today. This. I, it's so important that we acknowledge this day and this time, and some of us feel like Roe v. Wade will never go away, but as we heard today, even if it's legal, there are ways in which women cannot access safe care. So thank you so much for honoring this day and spending it with us. And now I think it's Cynthia again, so thank you. Stay here. And I would like... <laughs> um, I would like to ask Leslie, where are you, to come up, and Ellie. Um, you know, you all made a contribution when you came in, and that contribution helps support the work of the Reproductive Rights Network, which includes advocacy and some support for basic uh, patient um, services. But we also are going to give uh, a contribution to support the work of these organizations. So, Health Improvement Partnership. Here's your check. <laughs> and Santa Cruz Women's Health Center. <laughs> and Planned Parenthood. So. <laughs> so I want to thank you. And, and for us, this money will go to uh, the other important activity we do, which is try to cover all kids uh, in our county. And so it will go for healthy kids. And if you would like to contribute to healthy kids, there are brochures by side the hip brochures back there for this other important program. Take a look at the literature. Do what you can to help. and. Never say die here. <laughs> Thanks for coming.